so I, yeah, it has been an interesting career. I think mainly it's been, I've been really lucky. I, I'm an academic. Um, so I was, uh, I was part of the faculty at MIT and my, my, my academic expertise is around big data analytics and, and specifically data coming from mobile phone operators. Uh, and kind of by accident, I started working with mobile phone operators in the developing world. Like these were the organizations that were inundated with data. Like suddenly they had so many subscribers in places like India or Brazil or Indonesia. Um, and they had neither the computational horsepower nor frankly the hu human resources to deal with the petabytes of data that suddenly their, their subscribers were generating. And so I'd come in and I'd help them build models of churn and product adoption, help them to gain some insight into the underlying dynamics of their subscriber base. But the thing that they really cared about was this thing called ARPU, average revenue per user. And ARPU, whether you're in Brazil or Nigeria or uh, Vietnam, ARPU is plummeting. Yeah, this average revenue per user, and it kind of makes sense. The people who are buying phones for the very first time in Vietnam are making less money than the people who bought phones last year for the very first time in Vietnam. Uh, and so, you know, right now, the average mobile phone subscriber in the developing world is spending 10% of their day's wage on airtime. 10% of their income, and we're talking about, you know, over a billion people here, are, are, their income is going back to the mobile operator. It's a huge, relatively speaking, it's a huge amount of money. Um, and these operators know that they can't get it up to, you know, going from 10% is a massive deal. They're not going to be able to get it to 15%, right? So they're trying to figure out other ways to, to monetize this massive base. Um, so the genesis of, of this thing that I've built and this, this company that I've started actually came from, um, from Kenya. So I was, uh, I was volunteering actually in this hospital for, uh, for about 18 months in rural Kenya, helping out with some IT work. Um, and it was interesting experience, because uh, I was also kind of teaching at the University of Nairobi and doing various other research-related projects at MIT. But uh, by, by being on that ho in that hospital, I was starting to be exposed to different problems on the ground. And one of the problems, in fact, it was like the first two weeks I was there, I was approached by these two panicked nurses. Uh, and they came to me and said, hey, there's been this Matatu accident, you know, this, this traffic accident, and, um, you know, we've run out of blood at the local blood bank, and we desperately need to have an emergency blood transfusion. Will you, will you donate blood? Um, and I have this, this phobia with needles, uh, but, um, you know, when two panicked nurses in rural Africa come to you and say you, they need blood, um, you know, you suck it up and you, uh, you give the blood and then, you, then you, you, know, you feel like a hero for weeks on end and show off your bruise and tell the story to everyone who will listen. Um, and so I, I did that and it was great, but um, what was interesting was about a month later, uh, exactly the same situation happened, right? But it was the two different nurses. They came up to me and they're like, ah, you know, we desperately need your blood. There's been a traffic accident. Um, and by like the fourth time this happened, uh, I, I started trying to like, from out of more of my own self-interest rather than anything else, I started looking into what was the deal with blood supply levels and blood banks in rural Kenya. And the problem came at, down to latency. Right? So there are these guys at these centralized blood banks across, across the country that would basically take these tr uh, you know, trucks and drive from hospital to hospital trying to figure, measure out what the blood supply levels were in that rural, in that rural hospital and, what, and, and then you know, whether or not if the blood was below a certain threshold, uh, threshold they would then um, the next time around they would deliver the blood. And so you had this latency of up to like something like four weeks before you know, when the blood could get depleted to when it would be replenished again. Um, simply because there's just not a lot of information flowing. And so we built this SMS blood bank, a, a, a system that let these rural nurses text in what the blood supply levels were uh, in their remote hospitals. And we built this beautiful visualization um, that the guys at the centralized blood banks would log in and see in real time what the blood supply levels were. Um, and, you know, I thought this was a very clever solution to this problem. Uh, and the first week, it was awesome. I mean, we got into, a, you know, the... the, the Daily Nation, the, the local paper there, and it was a lot of press, and the rural nurses were texting in data, and the guys at the centralized blood banks were logging in and seeing in real time what the blood supply levels were, and more importantly, where the blood was needed. Um, but the second week that the system was live, about half the nurses stopped texting in data. And by the end of the month, uh, virtually no nurse was using this platform anymore, and, and ultimately it was deemed a failure. Uh, and it failed not because of any technical shortcoming. I mean, technically, this, this thing was bulletproof. It was, it was awesome. It failed because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part. And that lack of insight had to do with the price of a text message. Um, what, we were, uh, you know, what we were 
ex you know, basically expecting these rural nurses to do was send us a text message every day with the blood supply levels. And what I didn't realize was that sending that text represents a pretty substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage, right? So essentially, we were asking them to take a pay cut in order to participate in our platform, you know, something that fundamentally was not fair. Um, and, and I got lucky, right? I mean, because I was already working with virtually every mobile operator in East Africa, I had access to their back-end billing systems. Like, I was in this unique position where I could actually start changing the denominations of airtime that these rural nurses had in their accounts. I could start giving them money, essentially, on their phone uh, in exchange for a properly formatted text message with the day's blood supply levels. And it, it didn't take much. I mean, I was giving, we were giving them like 10 Kenyan shillings, enough to cover the cost of the text message and about a penny uh, extra to kind of say thank you. And, and literally, for that opportunity to earn one cent worth of airtime, virtually every rural nurse re-engaged with the platform. You know, it's now being rolled out across East Africa. Um, and, you know, what the, one of the striking things is that, you know, I'm, I'm now supporting, I think it's, I think we have like 24 hospitals on the Kenyan coast. And, you know, I'm paying for it out of pocket. And like last year, that cost was something like $240 all in, right? I mean, it doesn't cost much money, right? This is, not, this is something where we're generating really interesting data. We're get, providing essentially, a, you know, a little bit of money to these rural nurses. And, um, and you know, the system works. Uh, and it works far, you know, you know, you can start thinking about, and, and that's kind of what I started doing, is like, how does this thing scale? Um, and so originally, all of these other mobile operator partners that I was working with, well, when they started seeing that, like, hey, the Kenyan Ministry of Health is starting to just basically buy airtime that's getting funneled to these individuals, we, we want you know, large organizations to start buying airtime because it, go, it solves that ARPU problem. Instead of taking more money out of that rural Kenyan nurse's pocket, suddenly you can start taking money from the Ministry of Health's pocket. And if you can do it from the Ministry of Health's pocket, why not P&G's pocket or Pfizer, right, or Coca-Cola? Um, and so, you know, we basically started rolling out this technology and um, what was interesting was how fast it got adopted um, and how quickly I kind of got pulled out of academia and uh, put at the helm of um, this company that ha has growing, grown a lot faster than um, I feel comfortable with. Uh, you know, so we're now, we're, we're now have operations in 102 <coughs> countries um, and we've integrated with 237 mobile operators. Uh, and we can now pay people in over 70 currencies. Um, but the thing I think is profound is this, I, um, this, this kind of, well, what I believe is an unprecedented ability to be able to instantly compensate uh, almost half of our species, 3.48 billion people. And we can instantly compensate them friction-free. Uh, and, and we can do it in denominations as low as 10 cents. Um, so, you know, I see this as this giant compensation hammer, right? We suddenly have this ability to instantly put money into the pockets of, you know, huge numbers of people. Um, and, and frankly, the world looks like nails, right? So, you know, the, the first nail that we started going after um, was, again, was just, it was simply lucky. I mean, it was P&G coming to us. Um, and they had heard that we'd integrated with every mobile phone operator in the Philippines. And you know, before they started working with us to try to figure out what rural women in the Philippines thought about laundry detergent, you know, they were literally flying people from Cincinnati to Manila, they were renting Land Rovers, they were driving out into the field, and they're conducting face-to-face -face surveys of these rural women. Um, you know, we didn't have to have a sales team to like, make the case that you know, we can touch far more consumers, we can turn around the data far faster. Um, you know, you know, giving these rural women five pesos on their phones for filling out a, a short survey it was just a better, it was a better solution. Um, but then, you know, start now what's happening is using this not just to try to gain insight into these markets, but also trying to drive things like sales. And so you can go to rural India right now and you'll see billboards that say, hey, get 10 rupees off of Clinique Plus Shampoo. And you can go in and you, you go to that local bodega store, it's a store that has no technology at the point of sale. It probably has no electricity in the store. Uh, and that consumer, she can go and buy the bottle of shampoo, type in the unique code onto her phone, um, answer some questions about, uh, about herself and the, and the product, uh, and then ultimately instantly get 10 rupees. And, and from her perspective, you know, that's like getting 10 rupees back from that rural merchant's till. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's, I think that is kind of the, the interesting thing about the platform. 
And you know, so if you take, I know 3.48 billion is a hard number to wrap your head around. I mean, if you, if you take India, for example, I mean, we have a list of the 875 million active subs on network, meaning a list of the, you know, the 875 million mobile phone numbers that are currently live on every network in the, in the country. Uh, we can pick a number at random. I type it into my laptop, I type in 10 rupees, and when I push enter within seven to 10 seconds, no matter where that person is in India, you know, they could be in Delhi, they could be in rural UP, um, they could have an iPhone, they could have a 10-year-old Nokia candy bar handset. You know, that sub gets a message saying, hey, you just received 10 rupees. And you can go to that person and say, I can give you 10 rupees in cash, or I could put 10 rupees on your phone. And they view that as exactly the same thing. I mean, that's, that, that is kind of the key takeaway is that um, while we're essentially crediting their mobile account, they view this as currency, right? They're spending 10% of their day's wage on scratch card top up. So suddenly this is now 10 rupees they can keep in their pocket instead of going out and uh, buying yet another scratch card. And so, you know, from this platform, my hope is that we're starting, you know, we can do, we can, we can hit far more, far more nails than we have been hitting to date. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, what's great about the model is that, you know, the, you know these, uh, the mobile operators think that's wonderful because suddenly that's 10 more rupees they could use to buy our time. You know, the you know, client like Unilever loves it because that's 10 rupees they could go to use to buy more shampoo. But from our perspective, what's great is that this is, this is truly this ability to be able to actually put money into our pocket. It is putting money into this consumer's pocket and we're doing it at a massive scale. Um, the thing that I wanted to, the nail I wanted to talk about um, to, to close is this idea of um, uh, basically getting money for data in, in an online sense, right? So we're living in an age right now where um, all of our behavior online is, is to some degree being tracked. We're leave, living in the era of cookies, right? Anytime you buy something on Amazon, right? Anytime you tag something on Facebook, anytime you watch that YouTube video, this is all being logged in a giant database. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of different companies now trying to start coupling that online data with offline data. And, um, you know, this has sparked a lot of consternation amongst both privacy advocates and the general population about the fact that, hey, well, you know, maybe, maybe there, we should start talking about an individual's right to privacy and, you know, who owns this particular type of data. Um, I, I'm not going to spend the rest of my time talking about the privacy debate. Um, but rather, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we could reframe this tracking um, and perhaps empower the individuals who are generating the data. Because what is happening now is that basically you're seeing the massive companies go out and just gather as much information about you as a consumer as they possibly can, seemingly irrespective of how much you're complaining about the fact that, you know, you, you don't feel comfortable with this. Um, and so, you know, what we're starting to see now is that the reason why all of this tracking is occurring is, is very simple. It's because of advertising, right? You know, all of these companies that are trying to basically following your digital footprints as you surf the web or, you know, do various activities, they're trying to build a picture of who you are so that they can serve you a banner ad that's a little bit more likely to, uh, you're, that little bit, you're more likely to click. And um, it's still gonna be obnoxious, it's, but if you just click, if there's a 1% chance that you're gonna click it, uh, or 1% greater chance, um, suddenly they're netting millions of dollars, right? And so, you know, they kind of don't care what, what you think. And like, as long as, as long as they can basically give you that banner, that obnoxious banner ad that's just a little bit better than the previous obnoxious banner ad, you know, they're making a ton of money. Um, I think that there's, there's something broken there. And the other thing that's really broken is just how, you know, what they think of, you know, what their inference actually is. I mean, Google did this brave thing of, uh, you can go into your ad preferences and see, you know, based on all of the, the, the web surfing data that you've had, you know, what does, who does Google think you are? Like our, our director of business development, Sheila Subramanian did this. Um, and Google thinks that she is a mid forties male in the finance industry. Um, you know, based on, based on five years of web browsing. Uh, the ironic thing is that Sheila spent most of her career working at Google, uh, running their emerging markets team. Um, <laughs> so, and, and if Google can't do it, like a lot of these smaller ad networks, they're having an equally hard time. So, you know, this is the frustrating thing from my perspective is that there is a huge amount of data that we as consumers are handing over um, without getting any type of benefit back. Um, and you know, the data that we're handing over, the frustrating thing from a, as a data scientist perspective is just that you know, the data's not even being used particularly well, right? I mean, it's getting all of this personal data and they're, they, you know, they, they, um, they can't get it right. 
So, you know, from my perspective, this whole industry needs to change, right? I mean, people are not cookies, right? You know, individuals have real names, they have real vocations, they have real interests. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't something that just basically, you know, I, I think that there's, there's this kind of fundamental misconception um, and this kind of desire for data within the ad tech industry that is, um, is not putting us on the right course, nor is it leading to particularly um, good results for the user, right? I mean, we still have obnoxious banner ads. Um, and so, you know, what I'm hoping to do as kind of the next nail for our giant compensation hammer, right, is to instead of kind of lurking behind you as an individual consumer and trying to follow what websites you're going to and build a model of the fact that, yes, I think with a 65% chance you're female, um, you know, I, I think what we want to do is get in front of these individuals, right, and, and start engaging with them. Uh, I think there's a huge number of, of people out there who are not, or, or kind of disenfranchised with the fact that there are these nameless and countless companies making millions of dollars mining their data that they didn't really give them permission to mine. Um, and I think, you know, there is an opportunity here to start taking these individuals and making them active participants in this value exchange, right? Because there are millions of dollars to be made here. Uh, if we can actually start building better ads, increasing the efficacy of these different campaigns, you know, clearly there's, you know, there's, there's hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and so what we're doing is, is kind of that. I mean, we're working with ad agency or ad networks right now, um, not to kind of give them a better model for all the data that they're capturing, but what we're bringing to the table are people. Right, actual, real, honest to goodness people, you know, in emerging markets that are willing to share their data, you know, explicitly. I am male. I am, you know, 36. Um, in exchange for some monetary compensation, um, and what we're what we're showing is that just by actually using real data, we can provide a much better relationship with these, uh, you know, between these massive global brands um, and the ultimately the consumers they're trying to reach. You know, this, it, this, and it doesn't take much money. I mean, if you go back to that Kenya example, um, you know, if you take a, 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 the, the average 18 to 24 year old Kenyan female in a rural area, right, we can get a 25% response rate um, you know, to the standard basic demographic uh, questions that Google is trying to mine using petabytes of data. We can get her to respond to that with you know, one out of four times uh, with 17.5 Kenyan shillings. That's the equivalent of about 20 cents, right? Um, and, and suddenly you're having, you're, you're not just having some real ground truth data, you're actually starting to build a relationship with this individual consumer. Um, and so I guess the point I'm going to leave you with is the fact that, you know, we've got, you know, it, just in the developing world, there's, there's over $200 billion that's being spent on advertising, you know, going into the pockets of those companies that are, are following you around on the internet, trying to figure out what your gender is, going into the pockets of the people who own billboards in that rural area. Um, what I would really advocate for, and I think the idea that I, I'd love to get people to start thinking about is, you know, it, wouldn't it be more efficient to bring the consumer into the, into the value exchange, right? Um, if we can redirect that 200, if we can even redirect half of that $200 billion, away from the pockets of the people who own billboards in that community or radio stations or television channels and directly into the pockets of the consumers that these big global brands are trying to reach, we could give a billion people a 5% raise. And, and that's extraordinary, right? And it's, it's because we could basically give a billion people uh, enough money to base have their mobile phone bill. So instead of spending 10% of their day's wage on scratch card top up, instead of spending 10% of their income Go, going basically to the mobile operators, we can reduce it to 5% by simply making this market more efficient. And that's 5% more income that they could use for, for literally anything. Um, you don't get many opportunities in life to give a billion people a 5% raise. Uh, but from my perspective, this, is, this has been very much uh, a worthwhile endeavor and, 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 and worth taking at least a brief sabbatical from academia to pursue. So thank you.